wonderful opportunity to be exhibiting at the Westport Art Center. I'm honored and um, very grateful. Um, so I am a fine art photographer, and I take make photographs with an 8x10 view camera and film. Um, and I focus primarily on still life photography, but I also love to take portraits of of trees, flowers, and leaves, and plants um, in my garden and around my home. And that's kind of an inspiration for me also, and it feeds into my still life photography. Um, I have to tell you, though, that I don't really consider myself a photographer. I really consider myself an artist that thinks like a painter and a collagist and happens to make images with an 8x10 view camera. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I love being in an exhibit like this here today, because I want my work to be in conversation with artists who work in a variety of mediums. Um, so I've been, always been drawn to 20th century painting and sculpture. And in order to feed and cultivate my creativity, I have a very large collection and a serious addiction to art history books and uh, photography books. And I've noticed in these books that there is a common thread. And the thread is that a lot of my, fam my favorite female artists are photographed in these books um, as backdrops behind their famous husbands. So for example, um, you will have Jas Jackson Pollock on the floor. You know, we all know that he likes to paint on the floor. And you'll have Lee Krasner sitting behind him demurely, um, you know, looking over him. And this sort of thing goes on all day long um, between, let's say, Eva Hesse and her husband, Tom Doyle, and Helen Frankenthaler, who I think divorced Motherwell because he forbid her to use cobalt blue. Um, <laughs> this actually happened. So, um, you know, we all know now, it's common knowledge, that the 1960s was a male-dominated art world, and the conversation was led by men. Um, so I'm here to rewrite that historical narrative and see if I can sort of uh, give these women um, the, um, you know, the time that they deserve here. Um, so it's great news for me because apparently appropriation is a legitimate genre here. And, um, so what I, and so this has been the backdrop for me and the inspiration in um, creating the series that you see here today. And this is titled A Studio of One's Own. Mm -hmm. um, I actually arrived at the title after Virginia Woolf's book, A Room of One's Own. Um, I, and being that I'm a still life photographer, I spend a lot of time in my studio. And it's, you know, it's all about creating and curating your own reality. So um, I, these women are my heroes and my idols. And um, I kind of thrive off of their visual language. And I try to bring their language and their aesthetics into my work. Um, so again, back to appropriation, I ordered this, this is Bridget Riley, um, she's a rock star. Um, she didn't have as many issues uh, with men, um, but she didn't quite get the recognition that she deserved. And now she's 86 years young today, her paintings are fantastic, they go for at least $5 million. Um, and um, here I ordered this um, photograph of her from the National um, Portrait Gallery in London. And um, she is in her studio here. Um, and then I set this photograph up on a table about a foot away from my view camera. And I want it to feel like a collage. I love when people are surprised and they don't realize that it's a photograph. Um, and so I arrange these objects around um, the artwork that you see here. Let's say Eva Hesse here in her studio and Helen, Helen Frankenthaler. Um, in a book here, she's pictured in her studio on 21st Street. Um, this is Helen Frankenthaler, and I call it and the dot motif. This is wrapping paper from of Damien Hirst, and um, it's kind of like a little dig against him because I kind of consider her the real artist, and he's kind of a backdrop for her. Um, <laughs> so bring it on. Um, but I hope with this work to change, you know, the way that people view photography. Um, you know, it's an interesting um, medium, and uh, we live with it every day, and it kind of dictates a lot of the times that we view the world. Um, and those photographs are there forever. 
Um, and I just love working with the medium and the way um, it illuminates the materials the same way a painter would also work with their materials. And photography is unique because here you can see the light um, passing through, you know, this kind of these Roscoe gels that I've laid over there. And then I've also cut out mirror um, and you catch a little bit of her reflection um, in this piece here. And so we're playing with three-dimensional elements against the picture plane, um, which is a lot of the same things that painters and collages are concerned with. Mm -hmm. So, Tracy, yeah. can you talk a little bit about um, how much you know about what these images are going to look like before you've made them? I mean, sure. to what degree are you adding and subtracting, and do you use all the material that you've set aside, or how, how do you compose? Oh, it's a process. Okay, yes. so it's a very tedious process. I have my view camera here. Um, I don't know if anybody is familiar with a view camera, but I work with an 8x10 view camera, and it's pretty hardcore. The image is upside down in the back, and you're under a dark cloth. I'm on top of a ladder. Um, and then about a foot away from my view camera, I have about a 4 foot by 6 foot table, and I'm working with natural light. Okay, so I'm timing everything around the light that is perfect uh, for my setup. And so the great thing about the view camera and why I work with this camera is that there's a grid on the back. Okay, and even in, in painting and printmaking, you know, we always have that constant vertical and horizontal grid. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is a tremendous tool that where I'm able to line up my images and really um, it enables me to play with that collage aesthetic. So um, a lot of times, you know, I don't know exactly what the final image will look like. And I think that is part of the fun of making art. Because if you really knew what were you going to do, then why do it? So that's kind of the surprise about expanding and growing your work um, and, and seeing where you can go with it and creating a new visual language, which is, which is what these women did. Um, and to me, that is one of the important goals as an artist is to take what you have from the past and add to it and, and invent language. So um, these. And to make an image like this, it might take me about a week. I play with it, I go back and forth. I'm literally um, like a collagist. I'm cutting out the Roscoe gels. I'm laying them over the original image. I'm using a lot of dust, because that is a photographer's enemy. Um, I will, each exposure here, so I'm shooting it with film, would be about 10 to 20 seconds for an image. I will take about eight sheets, because things go wrong and you never know. I bring them into the city to have them developed. I have the work scanned, so now they're digitized. And it's kind of an interesting um, conversation between working with a 19th century camera and bringing them forward into you know, the modern world. And when you scan them, you're getting um, a fantastic saturation of color. You know, so that these photographs are contemporary and they live in the present tense. So I'm not, I don't want to be nostalgic. You know, I like to look to the past in, ter in terms of um, giving these women their credit, but I also want the photographs to feel, you know, like they're of our time or ahead of our time would be good too. Um, so, um, and then there are some maybe minor corrections. Let's say now you have a digital file, so that's nice if there's a piece of dust. Mm -hmm. You can just zap that out easily on Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And beyond the gels, what are yes. the other materials that you've included in these? It okay. looks like you've got a big store of yes. stuff that I, you can... Yes, because my background, actually, I studied at Purchase College um, in the early 80s with Jan Groover. And um, she had a mantra at that time, is that we don't take photographs, we make photographs. Mm -hmm. And I got on board with that. I took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so even if I'm taking pictures of a landscape or plants or flowers, I'm always kind of composing them you know, as um, a collage. Mm -hmm. um, and so here in this instance, um, I'm, I really approach, you know, the picture making process in photography the same way a painter or a collagist approaches their canvas. And so I'm taking this mirror and I'm, I'm cutting it um, with a blade and I, I spray painted this mm -hmm. to give it sort of a mesotint feel. Um, I'm cutting out this paper and overlaying it. Um, painting this, these dots over here. Um, the bottles are painted as well. Um, here, um, this is actually, this is interesting, this is one of my old photographs behind the Roscoe gels of these pears. So I kind of like Jasper Johns goes back and he mines his work. I mine my own work because the other thing that I learned at Purchase College as an artist, you work from your work. 
And that's one of the secrets because, you know, everybody um, gets creative blocks and the most important thing is to keep working. What does Chuck Close say? In, you know, inspiration is for amateurs, the rest of us just get to work. So it's not a good idea to think about it. You want to show up and just, you know, you play, you work, and you, you know, you build your experience. Um, I love reflective things here. So we have tin foil. Um, let's see what else. Um, again, this is wrapping paper. Um, and then overlaying that, and this again, this is the same mirror that I spray painted as well mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, unify the picture plane. Great. Thank you. So, thank you. So questions? Much. Questions? Yes. Absolutely. Questions. You shot this on 810 Ectochrome? Uh, uh, color film. I think ec yeah. Ectochrome is... Not slide. Film. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, uh, transparency. Yeah. That's right. E I'm no, interested in... Negative. Not possible. Oh, so it's uh, C41. It's C41. Yes. Okay. I'm interested in the perspective yes. on something. Like, it looks to me like the picture in the center was shot with a wide angle lens because you got distortion. Right. And I'm also interested in the fact that there is no shadows there. Mm -hmm. That it's a very, so is this backlit in some way? Okay, mm -hmm. so good question. It's actually, um, I have, um, the camera is here, okay, and you have the table here. and. One of the reasons why I work with a view camera is because you can change the perspective on the back of the camera, and that's really why I use it. So you can... So you distort it from the back of the yeah. camera. Yeah. I don't really think of it as distortion. I think of it as really changing the drawing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what I'm, I'm really looking for. Um, and then there are cues to the fact that this is natural light. So you can see um, there's a shadow here, a very subtle shadow. You can see the reflection of my window. Mm -hmm. um, bouncing mm -hmm. onto this bottle, mm -hmm. and that was kind of something that I was thinking of. Um, this was a pre uh, prevalent theme in Diva Hess's work. She was very interested in windows. Mm -hmm. So um, these are things that kind of like kind of creep in to the subject matter. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.